You know, when I was a young man, well, younger anyway, one of the greatest lies that was ever told to me was that I would somehow naturally become more conservative and less, less liberal, less radical as I grew older. Have you guys ever heard this one? Now, as I've gotten older, I've found that this psychological drift towards conservatism and thought and deed isn't rooted in age at all, but in wealth. It's a matter of psychological fact that, generally speaking, people become more conservative in their ideology as they get wealthier, not as they get older. It's just that for decades in the United States, as one got older, one tended to get wealthier as well. Now, unfortunately, nobody gets rich anymore, so we're really starting to see the lie behind this. But what really made this particular lie so attractive to so many and for so long, and what made it so insidious in its destructive power, is that it's rooted in an even greater lie. A lie that we tell ourselves constantly. That we inherently, naturally get wiser as we get older. Of course, like any good lie, any really good lie, this one is rooted in some hardcore truths. We want to assert that we get wiser as we get older because we don't want to disrespect our parents or our elders. We associate the respect and indeed the admiration that is the biblical due of all of those who've gone before us. We associate that with a degree of deference that really might not be due at all. I have to admit, I'm having a hard time with this idea myself, in part because it's really against my own interest to put it out there on the record, in the internet where it lives forever, that we might not have to defer to the wisdom of our elders. It's hard to even suggest that scripture might not support this inviolable authority of age, because if I'm being entirely honest, I don't know how to be a parent without that. I mean, if my kids find out that the Bible doesn't really tell them to listen to everything I say just because I'm older, just because I'm their parent, my God, our household could fall apart. Could you imagine the chaos? There'd be, there'd be no candy left anywhere in the city. They'd eat all of it. But... No matter how much I want it to be the case, no matter how much I want the authority of age to be mine, I have to admit that the Bible tells us a much different, much more subversive story. And not just when we get to the teachings of Mr. Jesus, let the children come to me for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Christ. No, this idea runs like a hidden thread throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments alike. Let's take a look at the Song of Solomon. Out of all the books of the Bible, this is perhaps the one that comes up maybe the least throughout the lectionary year. I mean, Zechariah, sure. Some of the more troubling parts of Proverbs, why not? All the begats from Matthew, of course, got to have those. But Song of Solomon is almost never. Why, why is that? I mean, listen to the absolute beauty of this text. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, for now the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. I mean, isn't that just the sort of thing we're all really longing to hear from the Word of God these days? I mean, in a time where we're all fearful and lonely and stressed and hurting, doesn't it feel really good to hear the Word of God reach out to you like sweet poetry with words that soothingly speak of this great and powerful love? Now, I know some of the more biblically astute among us today probably already know exactly why we don't use Song of Solomon more in church. It's because, truth be told, 
no matter how much we want to frame this text as an allegory of God's love for us or some abstract representation of the inner musings of Christ with respect to the great universal church, it's really just a long poem about a man and a woman who really deeply, truly love each other in ways that are simultaneously both beautiful and entirely inappropriate for church. In fact, when a young me asked one of my church elders this exact same question when I was growing up, that was the precise answer I got. It's inappropriate for church. As an adult, I gotta admit, I get it. The shall we say, goings-on between the two people in Song of Solomon isn't the sort of thing that would be entirely comfortable to explain to our younger congregants. And doing a deep dive on it now would definitely result in some awkward conversations over the Sunday dinner table once we're all done today. But inappropriate for church? A whole book of the Bible? Now, young me, lacking that wisdom of age, was thoroughly confused and utterly horrified at the answer I got when I got it from my elder all those years ago. I, I couldn't believe that a member of my church's leadership, an elder with all this wisdom of age, had just told me that part of the Bible wasn't suitable to be read in church. Of course, seeing my complete bafflement, the church elder looked at me with that combination of condescension and care that the elderly church ladies of the early 1990s pulled off so effortlessly. And she said that when I was older, I would understand. When I was older, I would feel the exact same way. Well, it's been close to 30 years now, and I do understand. I, I mean, I, I do. I get it. I really do. But I have to admit, I don't feel the same way. And if I'm being honest, I'm a little upset about it. I'm upset that the wisdom that age was supposed to bring to me was expected to diminish my appreciation for some of the most beautiful, most human expressions of love in the entire Bible. I'm upset that the wisdom that age was supposed to bring was expected to dull the artistry of this song into scandal. I'm upset that the wisdom of age seems to demand that I dismiss this beauty as somehow childish or ephemeral, as somehow not the most important word God has to say on the loving relationships between two individuals, completely ignoring the fact that this text, today's text, completely switches the inherent gender roles one would expect in a poem like this resulting in an expression of a woman being wholly empowered in a space where traditionally women were seen almost entirely as objects for men to enjoy at will. And I gotta admit, I'm upset that this wisdom of age doesn't just dismiss youthful idealism on this topic alone. In Matthew, Christ comes to explore this idea in a little more detail. He paints this image of children sitting around in the marketplaces and calling out their concerns to each other. And from our point of view, some 2,000 plus years hence, this part can seem a little difficult to understand. All this talk of flute playing and mourning, Jesus and John, it can be hard to figure out exactly what's being said at first glance. But imagine these complaints coming from your own kids. Mom, I played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. Don't you care about me? Da Daddy, my, my friend died and you didn't cry with me. Don't you care? Because, my friends, this is where we are all too quick to part company with the lives of our younger generation. When we ignore their joys and their sorrows and place our own busy schedules, our own stresses and fears and concerns on so high a pedestal that we can no longer see them, then we begin to separate ourselves from them. And not only from them, but from that wisdom and intelligence that God has revealed to them. And when we part company with them here, what comes next is that they will inevitably turn their eyes to us much more critically. 
They'll see how we dismissed the radical message of John on account of his asceticism and ignored the voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. They'll see how we dismissed the Son of Man as a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and never heard his message of peace, love, forgiveness, and reconciliation offered to all God's people. They will see how we dismiss the voices of the oppressed and disenfranchised among us, saying that if they just obeyed the law, then they'd still be alive right now. They'll see how we dismissed Christ himself when we told the poor that everyone can succeed in America if they just try hard enough. My friends, it starts small. These little ignorances beget bigger, more terrible ignorances until we realize that it is we who become ignorant. Now, look, I'm no stranger to this. I am regularly surprised by my children, and I'm thankful for all the times they remind me to be kind and push me to listen to them, because truth be told, most of the time I don't want to. Most of the time, I want to just insist to them that I know better, and they better listen to me if they know what's good for them. Most of the time, I just want them to stop questioning everything I say and listen for once. But they remind me constantly that they know better. That God has hidden things from us wise elder folk and revealed them to infants instead. They remind me of that constantly. And you know what? They're right. I want the voices of age to be the ones treated with the greatest authority because as someone who's getting older every day, I have a vested interest in maintaining my own authority. But God doesn't call me to maintain my authority. God calls me to listen to the cries of the voiceless and to do justice in God's name. I want the voices of age to be the ones treated with the greatest authority because making the distinction between respecting a person for who they are and what they've contributed over the years and accepting all they have to say is God-enshrined fact, that's some hard interpersonal work, and I really don't want to do that. But God doesn't call me to take the easy road, nor does God call me to choose between doing justice and being kind. God calls me to do both simultaneously. I want the voices of age to be the ones treated with greatest authority because I personally want to believe that all the work I've done for all these years is worth something and can't be bested by a particularly snarky third grader. But every time my daughter sets down whatever book she's reading or turns off the TV, if I'm being honest, and when she begins to tell us about the God who loves everyone no matter what, I have to admit that I'm called to listen because she knows more about it than I do. My friends, this is a scary time to be a grown-up. There are riots and diseases. There is suffering and pain and death on a scale that most of us have never imagined, let alone seen in our lives. These are challenges that for all our combined wisdom, for all of our combined experience, we have to admit that we really don't have a lot of great ideas on what to do. So let's listen to the children instead. Let's listen to them when they share their excitements. Listen to them when they share their pains. And listen to them when they look to the world. Because when they look upon the world, they are doing so not with the wisdom of age, but with the wisdom and intelligence of Almighty God given directly to them. Our children dream great and powerful dreams. Dreams of wonder, dreams of peace, dreams of majesty and dreams of love. They dream of the kingdom of heaven on earth here today. If we empower them rather than dismiss them, if we love and support them rather than thinking them unreasonable, we'll begin to see that they are both the dreamer and the dream. And they will dream a better world for us. A world free of injustice, a world free of oppression, a world free of pain and suffering and war, a world infused with a peace that passes all understanding, and a love that conquers all, just as God intended. Amen.